Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and Magnetic Reversal News, bringing you a magnetic excursion update Wednesday, July 30th, around 10 p.m. Mountain Time, 2025. The sixth largest earthquake in modern record has triggered a global tsunami warning on the Pacific Rim, and tsunamis have reached as far south as South America. The good news is that, well... 99.9% .9 of them were not life-threatening. More to come, so buckle up and keep calm. It's boom time. And now on to the tsunami updates. Central and South American authorities have ordered evacuations. Those have been lifted. And as predicted, a volcano in Russia starts erupting after the earthquake off the Russian coast. In fact, Kluchiskyoy volcano started erupting after the 8.8 .8 magnitude earthquake off the coast of Russia as Japan and Hawaii downgrade the tsunami warnings. This map shows much of the U.S. under heat advisories as high temperatures continue. The only problem is this is not anything like unprecedented heat. Here are the active heat alerts. The areas in peach have heat advisories, uh, and the areas in pink, uh, extreme heat warnings. There are no extreme heat watches on the map. And that's because temperatures aren't that high. Here are today's temperature highs. Just a few locations above 100 degrees. This is normal summer activity at the end of July. But the public, I guess, has a short memory and they believe the headlines. Well, the headlines in 1936 would have shown you that every state in the U.S. reached over 100 degrees in July, many reaching over 110. Yeah, dozens of states over 110 in July alone. Only five states were spared from 100 degree heat, including Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut and Florida. Oh, nope, Florida had 101 right there. So just four states. And the majority of states across the U.S. saw 110 or higher than 100 in July of 1936. Those are the facts. And that was, in fact, the hottest July on record in the U.S. Well before global warming. Keep your windows closed, kids. Wildfire smoke is pumping into parts of Michigan. Well, that was yesterday's headline, but it's still pumping into parts of Minnesota, say it soda. Yeah, the major plume has moved slightly north, but we've got poor air quality for over half of the U.S. states, extremely poor air quality for portions of western Colorado, most of Utah, portions of northern Arizona. So check out all the details at Fire and Smoke Map version 4.2. The links will be below. And good news, all this heat is going away, folks. Yeah, once August reaches us, take a look at this. This is Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's going to be cooler as soon as August arrives. All those areas basking in the hot conditions and humid conditions are going to cool down quite substantially, 5 to 10 degrees below normal. And the tropics are heating up in the eastern Pacific. We've got Tropical Storm Iona, 50 mile per hour sustained winds. The remnants of Tropical Storm Kelly. We've got Disturbance 1, we've got Disturbance 3, and we've got Disturbance 2. Now, 3 and 2 may be a threat to the Hawaiian Islands. These three systems are a threat to no one. But the Atlantic is a, pulling a blank here. Still no activity expected for the next week. And now the full forecast. Monitoring tsunami impacts across the Pacific and thunderstorms and heavy rainfall in the mid-Atlantic with fire weather concerns in the West. And you can see here those terrible air quality alerts for Michigan, Wisconsin, and say it ain't soda. Flood warnings and watches out for the mid-Atlantic. And let's get to the full forecast. Thunderstorms are expected to bring heavy rain and potential significant flash and urban flooding to the mid-Atlantic on Thursday, especially along the I-95 urban corridor. Dry conditions, gusty winds, and isolated dry thunderstorms will continue to bring critical fire weather threats to northwestern Great Basin into the interior northwest through Thursday 
Doesn't look like there's much precipitation coming anytime soon. But as we reach, let's say, mid-August, we could see a reprieve. A quick look over at Tornado HQ Live severe weather map, and we can show you where all the severe weather warnings are up. Just a few right now. Three severe weather warnings. A severe thunderstorm warning in Butler County, Chautauqua County, Cowley and Elk Counties in Kansas, as well as Greenwood and Wilson in Kansas. So heed the warnings there. Special marine warnings out for Western Lake Erie in Northern Ohio. So all you got to do is come over to TornadoHQ.com live severe weather map for all of the live severe weather warnings. No, you don't need a weatherman. You just need Tornado HQ. And a quick look at the GFS model, and we can see that there is going to be some potential flooding threat here in the second week of August for Florida and Georgia and maybe South Carolina and, well, the East Coast in general. Look at those totals. The areas in yellow, and bright yellow, 12 to 20 inches of rain there. Holy macaroni. Let's hope this model doesn't come true. But what we should be looking at is there is going to be some precipitation returning to parched areas of the West, including the Four Corners, Utah, and even Nevada. But Southern California remains in the dry hole through mid-August. And a lot of people have been fear-mongering that this 8.8 .8 is the sixth largest earthquake ever recorded. That is just untrue. That is so untrue that, well... I'm beyond words. Anyone with half a brain cell or even a low IQ could research the fact that this is the sixth largest earthquake since 1950, since modern records have been kept on earthquakes, including satellite data. So not the sixth largest earthquake ever recorded by any pale the Cascadia rupture zone has six, nine magnitude or greater earthquakes in the last thousand years. So there is that. This is, in fact, the sixth largest earthquake since many of you were born. Back to 1950. So just the last 75 years. Which means we have earthquakes approaching nine magnitude at least once every decade. Yeah, those are the brass facts from this data set. The Kamchatka Kriya earthquake was centered 74 miles east southeast of the city of Petro Palyosk Kamchatsky, which is a population of 165,000 according to the USGS, and it left several people injured according to the state news agency, some buildings damaged but no one dead. Tsunami waves of 10 to 13 feet hit Kurilsk in Russia, far east coast, after the quake, shortly after the quake. And the rest of the tsunamis were lesser than that all across the Pacific Rim. Some tsunami waves in California reached up to 8 feet, like in Crescent City. But very little damage and no injuries have been reported. This is all very good news. Now, if we want to talk about the 10 largest earthquakes ever recorded... That means back to 1950. That's it. We've got an 8.6 in ADAC. That's notable. An 8.6 in Indonesia in 2005, which was notable. But I want to take, take you through what's happened in the last eight decades. We had a flurry of large activity from 1950 to 19, the end of 1960. So 1950, we had an 8.6 magnitude in Pradesh, India, right here. 1952, we had a 9.0 magnitude in the same region of the Kamchatka. Um, 1960, and that magnitude 9.5 in Chile. And 1964, a magnitude 9.2 in Alaska. And 1965, an 8.7 in the Aleutians in Alaska. And then there was a lull. Well, and then it all picked back up in 2004 with a 9.1 magnitude in Indonesia, followed by an 8.8 .8 in Chile in 2010. We've got an 8.6 in Sumatra in 2012, as well as a 9.1 in Japan in 2011. So these large earthquakes are coming in packets of five or six that last for several decades 
with a 50 year periodicity. So back in the 50s and 60s, we had five big quakes near nine magnitude. And now in the 2010s and 20s, we've got five big quakes in the nine magnitude. Maybe we've got one more on the bucket list. We need another nine magnitude. We haven't seen a nine magnitude since 2011. Yeah, so the next nine magnitude, unfortunately, may occur here in Cascadia, where nothing has been reported ever in modern history. So do you see how that largest earthquake ever is nonsense? I think I just brought you all up to speed. Seismic update. We've got big aftershocks happening now, 5.3, 5.1. These aftershocks will continue. The way it works is if you have an 8 magnitude, an 8.8, .8, you should have 107 magnitude aftershocks, 1,000 6 magnitude aftershocks, and 10,000 5 magnitude aftershocks. That's just based on the statistics. It doesn't always work that way. In fact, it almost never does. But to have this many aftershocks is not a surprise. In fact, it is predicted. So don't be worried about all those aftershocks. Normal activity on a subduction zone. Overall, seismicity has cooled down worldwide. And here we have a video of the time-lapse eruption of Kluchiskov following the 8.8 .8 magnitude on the Kamchatka. We predicted it last night that Probably there would be one of the eruption, uh, one of the volcanoes on, on the Kamchatka erupting. I said Shivalush, but in fact, it is Kluchiskyoi. Shivalush has been erupting quite regularly, so it didn't really need the nudge to get it going, but Kluchiskyoi certainly did. Uh, and it puffed and passed, well, I think 18,000 feet. So let's get to that. Shortly after midnight, we had Kirishima blasting off a 5,000 foot puff and then Kluchiskyoi to 20,000 feet. So it took at least half a day before that trembler kicked off the eruption just a few hours after the show. Raventador to 14,000 foot today, Ibu to 7,000 foot, Sangay to 19,000 foot, Semeru to 15,000 foot, Popo to 20,000 foot, Liwotolo to 6,000 foot, and then we've got a recap of all the eruptions all the active volcanoes this month. We've got Nevado de Ruiz to 19,000 feet, Rodentador to 15,000 feet, Ibu to 7,000, Sangay, possible volcanic ash, Samaru, who knew, now you do, 15,000 foot blast there. Ducono, puffing and coughing and passing, Chivalouche to 12,000, Kluchiskyoi, explosive activity continuing today, an ash plume that rose to 20,000 feet, or 6,100 meter altitude, or flight level 200 was moving at 10 knots in the east direction. So Kluchiskyoi eruption has come to an end. Volcanic ash is not identifiable. Dukono is over as well. Kirishima also, also probably ending its eruption for the day. Volcanic ash at Nevado de Ruiz, Marapi to 11,000 feet. Shivalush to 12,000. So it is kicking up a notch due to maybe those rumblers. And that wraps up Worldwide Volcano News for the day. And that moves us over to space weather for July 31st. You can see the last 24 hours on the star. Low-level sea flares, impulsive. Three-day geomagnetic forecast, all quiet. Aurora potential is pathetic as we are down towards KP1. A number of minor sea flares have been detected during the last 24 hours with the majority centered around AR4155 near center disk here, but that is going to be turning around the limb in the next few days. There was an eruption behind the west limb, but as usual, earth-facing quiet is king. And a bolt is born. Atmospheric events underpinning lightning strikes have been explained, well, theoretically by scientists. And here's the paper coming out just two days ago. Photoelectric effects uh, in air explains lightning initiation and terrestrial gamma ray flashes. So here we, we have the connection between the sun, cosmology in our solar system, and weather in the form of lightning. Yes, it's all coming together, folks. <clears throat> in the study published July 28th in the Journal of Geophysical Research, the authors describe how they determine strong electrical fields in thunderclouds accelerate electrons 
that crash into molecules like nitrogen and oxygen. They produce X-rays and they initiate a deluge of additional electrons and high energy photons, which is the perfect storm from which lightning bolts are born. The findings here provide the first precise quantitative explanation for how lightning initiates in nature. And it connects the dots between X-rays, electric fields, and the physics of electron avalanches due to cosmic rays. How do you like them apples? Well, I certainly like the photography or the artist impression. What say you? Leave a comment below. Lee and I will be breaking this down uh, this weekend, Saturday, exclusively on our Rumble show when we finally get up that panspermia episode because this new paper coming out just two days ago has everything to do with why we are all alive here on Earth. And the Archuleta County Fair in my neck of the woods starts tomorrow. I submitted all of my wares uh, yesterday, including my garlic. I was unable to put any other vegetable crops in because I just didn't have enough time and I didn't know the requirements. We didn't have enough ripe tomatoes to enter or ripe cherry tomatoes, etc., or beans, whatever. But now that I know next year, I'm going to be entering the max, all 10, uh, I can enter 10 different slots here in the county fair. And there are thousands available what I did enter is my garlic in the open field category, open field garlic, not greenhouse, not hothouse, none of that, open field garlic in Archuleta County. I also entered a piece of petrified wood that I found in Holbrook, Arizona earlier this summer in the petrified wood category. And I also entered a Western relic, uh, a 20 foot long scoop shovel that back at the turn of the century was used for digging post holes or shallow wells. And I don't think any of you have ever seen a 20 foot shovel, but stay tuned for the video footage of my 20 foot shovel at the county fair. And we'll see how they do tomorrow because the judging happened today. The fair opens tomorrow. So as soon as I can get there, I'll see how we did on all three. I'm really stoked to go see if we got a ribbon. And the ribbon isn't for me. It's for the community. So they have stuff to look at. And it's for you out there to inspire you to do the things that we're doing here. And if you need any more inspiration, it's just six weeks away. The 36th annual Crestone Energy Fair, September 11th to 14th of this year. The theme is Nurturing Resilience. It's a free event in Crestone, Colorado, and it's now been extended to a three-day event. Thousands of people. All pour into this tiny little mountain town in one of the most beautiful settings on earth. Guys, if, if, if you've never done anything, this should be on your bucket list. Join us this fall for three days of education, entertainment, sharing, innovative, sustainable, and regenerative ideas in construction, lifestyle, and community. There are dozens, if not a hundred vendors uh, of their wares. Everything's handmade. Everything's natural. And well, we're going to be running a seed bomb clinic where you can learn to make your own seed bombs and well, make an impact in your local area. If you want to know what I'm talking about, simply volunteer for the Crestone Energy Fair. If you volunteer, you'll be able to find free housing. You'll get free food for the entire event. And the event is free. So, if you're bitching and moaning about not being able to go to festivals, all you have to volunteer, all you have to do is volunteer for the Crestone Energy Fair. You'll get fed, you'll get housing. Well, not housing, they'll let you camp somewhere or whatever, I mean, you can crash in someone's barn. But it's a community event. You will leave this event with more friends than you've ever made in a single weekend. Trust me. This is the place you need to be because of what is coming. And that is a boom to knowledge. Hit the thumbs up. Share this video. Half of you watching are unsubscribed. We're trying to get to 100,000 subs this year. Please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. We need your help. And most importantly, be safe. We love you. And that is a boom. Me.